afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. Today is Friday, October 28th, and I welcome you all to the state's premier civic affairs event. I'm Melody Rose, president of City Club, and I would like to welcome members and guests alike. Those of you who are with us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, and of course, those watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today we welcome three regional leaders who will discuss Greater Portland Pulse, which gathers data and provides a shared set of indicators to track social, environmental, and economic well-being for the Portland region. But first, just a few announcements. City Club's corporate and media partners are essential to the vitality and sustainability of club activities. I'd like to give a big warm thank you to our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and extend our deep appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors. Please join me in offering our sincerest thanks to our fall quarter sponsors, AARP, Oregon, Baron Liebman, and PGE. Thank you so much for your investment. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that we are always welcome further partnerships, and I would invite you to think about sponsorship. Please contact our friendly staff at the back of the room or call the city club offices. When good citizens engage in civil dialogue, they find the common ground that shapes well-informed public policy. City club develops good citizens. Your gift to the annual fund supports the programs that bridge us together across our differences. Please donate generously to City Club's annual fund using the envelopes found on your table or those at the back of the room. Your gift keeps Oregonians connected. Following today's speech, we'll be welcoming City Club members to the microphone as usual for a Q&A session with our speakers. In addition, we invite all audience members to write questions for speakers on index cards, which can be found on your tables. During the board host question, City Club staff will collect these cards and pick a few for me to read from the, my microphone at the table. We are sure you'll come up with some great questions for our speakers today. And now, to our program. Today's topic, Greater Portland Pulse, is actually a partnership between Metro, Portland State University, and more than 100 community organizations. Greater Portland Pulse created measures in areas ranging from education, environment, and the economy, to health, housing, and the arts. The resulting report, The Path to Economic Prosperity, Education and the Equity Imperative, serves as a first ever regional report card against which future progress will be measured. Today's speakers will describe what they see in this report, why it is important to their sectors, and how this project will move us collectively forward. The speaker who will open and close today's talk is Portland State University President Vim Vival. PSU president since August 2008, President Vivell previously served as provost and senior vice president of academic affairs at the University of Baltimore. Vivell is chair of the Coalition of Urban Serving Universities and sits on numerous community boards, including the Portland Business Alliance and the OHSU Foundation Board. Today's second speaker is Metro Councilor Rex Burkholder. Trained as a biologist, Rex worked as a science teacher and in the Northwestern forests. He was a founder and policy director of the Bicycle Transportation Alliance and also co-founded the Coalition for a Livable Future. He was elected to the Metro Council in 2000. He has served on national boards including Railvolution and the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations. Our final speaker today is Marcus Mundy. Marcus is the president and CEO of Urban League of Portland. He also serves as a principal at local healthcare compliance consulting firm, Mundy Consulting. He serves on many boards, including the OHSU Foundation Board, and is a member of the State Labor Commissioner's Oregon Council on Civil Rights. He was instrumental, in addition, in producing the most recent State of Black Oregon report. And now, please help me by welcoming our first speaker, Vim Vivell, Mr. President.
Thank you very much, uh, Melody. And uh, we're very pleased at Portland State, of course, to have the president of the City Club this year be one of our uh, star faculty members. And I trust that the uh, selection of this project to uh, be presented today had nothing to do with your presidency, but was based on good objective data and criteria, which is, of course, what we're talking about. And this truly today, uh, I think, sort of highlights uh, what Portland and what the City Club is about because this is really a presentation for policy wonks. You know, if you want to have uh, fireworks or rhetoric, uh, I think the uh, uh, rally at Pioneer Square today uh, of Occupy Portland with Pink Martini and Storm Large is clearly where you're going to have more fun along those lines. So that's pretty tough competition. So uh, we're very glad we appreciate your being here. At the same time, I don't think it's totally unrelated. The Greater Portland Pulse is really about creating a better future for the region, for everyone. Uh, to get a little wonky, it's about goals, it's about knowledge and data, and it's about accountability. We all, every day, uh, in the newspaper, at the news, we get a lot of data thrown at us. 50% uh, dropout rate, crime is down, foreclosures are up, unemployment is up. Teenage pregnancy is down. But which of these measures really tell us what we truly care about? And when we get data like that, what is really the relevant time period? As you know, sometimes you get data that measure from peak to peak or from trough to trough. And other times, people pick a peak year and compare it to a trough year. And you know that those data can be kind of misleading. Should we care about averages? Or do we really need to look at data broken down by neighborhood, by race, by gender, by age, et cetera? I think Occupy Portland and the national version of it has made us all aware, in fact, of how much inequity can be hidden behind averages on income or wealth distribution data. And then there's all the question of, are the data even true? As you know, 64.3% of all statistics are made up. So to deal with these challenges, we created the Greater Portland Pulse, a partnership between PSU, Metro, and more than 100 other public, private, and not-for-profit organizations to measure and focus on what is important for everyone in the region. The Greater Portland Pulse tries to answer this following question. What outcomes are really important to this community? What are outcomes are so important that we should measure them and agree on what are the right measures, that we should keep track of them over time, and then, very importantly, talk with each other about how we can coordinate to improve these outcomes. Over the course of the past 18 months, Metro and PSU have worked with many other partners to answer that question. In good Portland style, we organized a very broad advisory committee. We then formed 10 data teams with even more people, with representatives from all these organizations to think about what metrics really matter. Then, of course, we collected the data and we put it on a wonderful interactive website called portlandpulse.org. And we developed a report that summarizes the findings from our first analysis of the data. And if this weren't a program that is also broadcast on radio, I would now just spend the rest of the time showing you the data and having, you know, putting you right on, on, the, on the web and showing you the data because that's really where we have all the really cool uh, data and the graphs. But um, I'm going to try to collectively with my colleagues here paint a picture of what it's all about. Now, Greater Portland Pulse also enhances the partnerships that encourage better coordination around the things that matter. This partnership began with an agreement with Metro several years ago, and I want to acknowledge Metro's consistent commitment to this partnership that started with Michael Jordan when he was still there and continuing with the Metro Council, represented today uh, by Rex Burkholder and also by Catherine Harrington um, and uh, Chair uh, Tom Hughes. Catherine over there, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Tom Hughes could not be here today. They've been great partners in this effort. From there, the partnership expanded. 
and we worked with many local governments, nonprofits, banks, utilities, and community groups. For example, we worked closely with the city of Portland to develop measures for their Portland plan, which is the city's new strategic plan. Since those projects were developing at the same time, so we were able to coordinate the objectives and use similar data. So while Greater Portland Pulse tracks progress on shared regional goals, and by the way, when we talk about the region, we mean the four county region, including Clark County across the region. The Portland plan tracks progress on similar goals for Portland and its neighborhoods. And you can find out more about the Portland plan at pdxplan.com. But that's just one example of how we align our efforts. We've made similar connections throughout the four county region to ensure that the goals reflected by Greater, Greater Portland Pulse represent a truly broad set of interests, sectors, and concerns. Now, the third reason for my commitment to this project is, frankly, that I'm a little competitive. It turns out, actually, that there are a lot of other cities that have beaten us to this punch. Minneapolis and Seattle, no surprise, because we will always look at them as sort of progressive cities that are ahead of the curve. But, you know, I felt really bad when I saw that places like Cincinnati, Boston, Pittsburgh, and Chicago and Baltimore, where I spent a lot of time, have actually been doing this for a lot longer with a lot of resources, with a lot of great data, and a lot of experience on how those data and those indicators then move to collective action and better interventions to make the community a better place. So surely, if they can do it, we can do it better. So the first results of our conversations and data collection efforts are posted on that website, portlandpulse.org. We're going to say that a bunch of times. Um, and the site presents indicators for our region in nine areas. We have nine areas. Economic opportunity, education, healthy people, safe people, arts and culture, civic engagement, healthy natural environment, housing and communities, and access and mobility. Now, I mentioned earlier, that's in nine areas, that we had 10 data groups, because we created a 10th group that looked at the whole issue of equity across all nine of these data areas. Because again, it gets to that question of we don't want to just look at averages. We want to be able to say specific things about access to opportunity and how these indicators might affect different groups. And again, it's different groups as measured perhaps by geography, by race, by ethnicity, by age. There are different ways of slicing the pie that are relevant for different questions that you might ask. Now, the point of this project is the ongoing collection of data over time, but we can also do regular reports on specific topics. So in this first round, after we collected the data, we took a step back, and we looked at the set of indicators as a whole and it identified connections among them. The report that came from that is entitled The Path to Economic Prosperity, Education and the Equity Imperative, and it provides a summary of what we saw in the data. And let me just mention a couple of those data that really mattered to us. You know, PSU obviously cares a lot about student success, but we also know that we can only do so much unless the students that come into Portland State have had a successful high school experience. And we want kids from all over the region to have had a chance to have that successful high school experience. So that's, of course, why we're very concerned that within our region, only about 70% of the students graduate from high school within four years with a regular diploma. And furthermore, that this rate is much lower, less than 50%, among African American, Latino, and Native American students. Furthermore, the demographic data that we've looked at shows that the Latino population in our region has grown by almost 70% since 2000. So the Latinos now comprise about 10% of our population, but over 18% of the people under 18 years of age. Combining these data simply sort of emphasizes that we must work more closely with our partners in public schools, community colleges, and not-for-profits to reach out, especially to the Latino population, to make sure that our mission at PSU of raising the percentage of the population with a college degree 
is indeed attainable. And that's why we started the Exito initiative that is a special outreach effort to the Latino population, why we created uh, Casa Latina on campus to create that safe haven for this new group of students. I'm also reminded by this data of the strong relationship between educational attainment and unemployment. Because while you hear a lot now about the unemployment among college graduates, it's still important to know that unemployment for people with a BA degree is only about 6%, while it is about 14% for people with a high school education, and almost 20% for those without a high school diploma. So the Greater Portland Pulse data allows us to see the connections between education, economic prosperity, and our changing demographics. It helps us then identify the leverage points for improving multiple outcomes. We've been very involved in the Cradle to Career Initiative, which just got renamed to be the All Hands Raised program that the Portland Schools Foundation really uh, is the backbone organization for. And that program showed very much how much data can drive performance. It is based on a model in Cincinnati, another thing that we stole from Cincinnati, where they found out that by agreeing as a community on the key outcomes along the education pipeline, being able to read by third grade, being able to do algebra by sixth grade, and so on, and then measuring that for different subgroups and publishing those results makes people focus on the key points where you need to succeed and that by doing that, you begin to evaluate the programs that really make a difference. And you begin to see that while there are many good ideas around, there are not a lot of bad ideas about how to improve education or any number of other things. But it is true that some programs are better than others. And it's only by beginning to measure it that you can begin to see how you should invest to really go for the maximum impact and begin to have good results drive out merely mediocre ones. The Greater Portland Pulse, I think, is a key way to begin to do this across nine key areas of what makes for a healthy community with many indicators beyond that, and it will help us have the discussion about what really matters to us as a community. Now, to have further discussion of these in more detail, I'm turning it over to Rex Burkholder to give his perspective on this project. Rex. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm trying to think of a joke about measurement, but then I was told that's not very tasteful. So I'll keep the jokes about measurement out. But I'm talking about what Metro's interest is in this project and why are we engaged and thinking that's very important. Because Metro, not just because we're data geeks, as you might think, but because we care deeply about the future of the community. And actually, our charter states that our job, the number one job of the Metro Council, is to provide a sustainable, quality of life for this generation and future generations. So it's outcomes that we're interested in. The outcomes specifically that the council has identified along with our partners in the region are creating vibrant communities, economic prosperity, providing people with transportation choices, clean air and water, leadership on the issue of climate change, and equity. So why are we engaging in this larger effort? Well, one is that Metro is one government with one set of responsibilities, but the health of the region depends on the actions of all, and not just governments. As, as President Bevel was saying, it's a partnership among many players, because it's the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the universities, and governments that make decisions every day about actions they take, investments they make, that affect the future of the region, individuals as well. And so how do we guide them? You know, I don't know about you, but the first thing I read in the paper in the morning is what temperature is going to be and is it going to rain or not? You know, that's very important data for me because I ride my bike to work and I don't want to have wet socks. And so that's critical data. So as a governor of, this, of one part of the government here, for me it's very important about what is going on out in the world and what decisions are we going to make and investment decisions we might make and how are they going to move the dial in the direction that we prefer. So working with the partnership is, I think the key thing here is that you can take actions without considering the actions of others, but they are not as effective or as help you reach your goals as if you act in concert. 
And so knowing how our decisions on transportation affect the decisions of social welfare agencies in terms of serving their clients, or our decisions on land use and expanding the urban growth boundary or not expanding the urban growth boundary, how does it affect the local government's ability to deliver services or the health and welfare of the local residents? That's data we don't have, and the greaterportlandpulse.org, www, is where that data is collected, and therefore it's an easy way for everyone to see it and be able to understand how well are we doing. So the other big issue is, and I have a lot of experience with this issue because I've done a lot of work on the Columbia River crossing, is that this region is not limited to the three counties and it's certainly not limited to just the urbanized area of the three counties on the Oregon side of the Columbia River. People who live and work in Clark County have very big impacts and very big stakes in the rest of the region and it's vice versa. There, that geographic boundary of our region is much greater than any single government, governing entity we have, maybe the federal government, but this, a lot of these issues are actually global as well. So how do we talk about the issues that face us when we have all these boundaries that we've placed between us? So greaterportlandpulse.org is a way of collecting data in a, in a common way so that we can understand how these, it, these areas relate to each other. And because I, having uh, lived a long time in north northeast Portland, I have a lot of neighbors who now have Vancouver addresses, for example. Yet their churches are in north Portland, their job may be on this side of the river as well, and they have a lot of connections, and it's not just the bridge or the lack of a bridge that makes that connection there. So the third reason is that no one knows everything and not even a data geek organization like Metro has all the data. And that looking and seeing the world from the great variety of perspectives and the great variety of experiences in the world are, is very valuable for making smart decisions and wise decisions. I've learned over the years that I certainly know, don't know everything about the world, and a lot of that's because I, in my life has been an engagement with my neighbors, and especially neighbors who have a different life. So working with communities of color, working with uh, Native American populations, working with people who live in different areas, I understand that there are quite a bit of different ways of looking at the world and experiencing that world. And that's, as President Vavell mentioned, the role of the equity group that we set up was very important for saying, Let's make sure that we see the world from all perspectives. And the important thing is, that's Im so important, why that is so important, is because that's how you make good public policy. And again, I hope that public policy is about being wise, to understand the world in a holistic way and understand that your decisions affect everyone in the world. And so wisdom is about how do you improve everybody's lives and you don't know if you can do that until you know what their lives are like. And then that issue of wisdom and making smart decisions, the last reason that I think Metro is engaged in this, is that we, understanding how the, rela the relationships between all the actions we take and their impact on the other data points, but they're not data points, they're people, is something you need to know in order to make those wise decisions. And so that you can have shared, uh, the shared vision of the future based on the shared understanding of, the, of today and a shared vision for the future. That's why Metro's engaged in this. So let me tell you a couple things which you know, jumps out to me, okay? The bike rider, transportation junkie. Key issue here is that we do know on a per capita basis, on an average basis, people in the Portland metropolitan area drive a lot less. They spend a lot, money on, lot less money on transportation. The air quality is cleaner on average. But what comes out of understanding the data on a granular scale is that there are, and one of the pieces of data is that there are 48 trans census tracts, average about 4,000 people in a census tract. So 48 of those where people spend more than 25% of their income on transportation, more than they spend on housing. Uh, and so you have a significant part of the population that doesn't benefit from transportation choices that we invested in, that don't live near where they work or where their kids go to school. And so they're spending a huge amount of their income on just getting their basic needs met. Key piece of learning for us. Another learning is 19 census tracts. People pay more than 60% of their income on the combined cost of housing and transportation. 
60 percent of your income. You know, how much do you have left for food, energy, uh, clothing for your kids, whatever you need, if you are spending 60 percent of your income on just a place to live and getting around? So these are key pieces of information that come out of this that strike me. What I encourage you to do is to go to www.portlandpulse.org and see for yourself uh, that, and it, as again, as President Vivell said, if we could show you on a screen, you'll see that what it's set up to be is a very easy, accessible way of looking at data and you can look at it at any level you choose from whether you just have a question about your neighborhood in terms of you know, where's the bus lines or how much bus service do we have here to wanting to understand what are the, the impacts in a very deep level on your community. Metro is committed to Greater Portland Pulse and we're working with the partners around the region to develop the structure and funding model for this effort so it is sustainable itself. Because measurements, doing it one time or two times, doesn't give you the information you need to understand how change is happening in your community and what needs to happen in terms of your actions to move that in the positive direction if it's going the wrong way. So the idea of a stable, sustainable organization is very critical to this, and we're asking our fellow governments to participate. We're working with the private sector and the universities and, and others to make sure that we can do this over time so we can use this tool in the way it should be used, which is not just, okay, let's take a snapshot, but let's take that home movie that shows that we're all growing together and growing up and prospering in our region. Thank you, and I'm gonna invite Marcus Mundy, one of our partners up. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for letting me speak to you today. Um, Portlandpulse.org, okay, okay, just so you won't forget. Um, people ask me, as the president and CEO of the Urban League of Portland, why we would be interested in participating in Greater Portland Pulse. After all, we've already published the groundbreaking State of Black Oregon report, which showed that disparities faced by African Americans are persisting and in some cases getting worse. We participated and led, helped lead the uh, Coalition of Communities of Color report, the unsettling profile, the, discussing what's going on in Multnomah County, and exploring the disparities there. So why would we now participate in yet another effort that develops measures of performance and well-being for the region? And, and I've frequently said myself, you know, we know what the numbers are, whether they're five points off or three points off directionally, so why would we do this? Well, I'll give you three major reasons why we would do this. Simply, number one, because equity should be on everybody's agenda. The Urban League, oh, okay. The Urban League and the coalition won't be successful if we are the only people who are talking about the need to address gaps in educational, economic, and social progress. Um, as, express, as expressed by Dr. Emmanuel Pastor when he came out and talked to our group in April, April, and also by Dr. John Powell of the Kerwin Institute who has worked with the Portland African American Leadership Forum and other efforts in the region, we need to create a broader base for economic success. And that means including more people in successful education, health, and workforce training programs, and excluding more people from the criminal justice system. Um, that needs to be a broadly shared goal for our region, a broad agenda, but with specific steps. The second reason is that because we must connect to the broader networks working in the economic, educational, and social systems. We say this over and over, but we have to actualize it. There are a lot of conversations going on right now about equity in our region and in our community. For example, the Urban League, along with our community partners, advocated the much talked about City of Portland Office of Equity and Human Rights. We think this Office of Equity is a step in the right direction. We participated in, in the Equity Technical Advisory Group, ETAG, I'm, I know it by the acronym, for the Portland Plan, which you heard about earlier, which now has a strategy to address the need for investments in all these things, neighborhoods that lack sidewalks, good transit, healthy food, high quality affordable housing, and we're part of a lot of the conversations, whether it's with the Community Investment Initiative, Coalition for a Livable Future, 
Posey, who just came out with Eco Districts, OCF, OHSU, even the Department of Human Services just came out with a, with a wonderful report on the state of equity in the state of Oregon. Wonderful in that it shares about information regarding the disparities and gives some finite steps on how to move forward. The public schools, they're focused on closing the achievement gap. They're holding courageous conversations throughout the school system, certainly Portland, but other districts as well and how to give students of color, low-income students, and those geographically challenged the opportunity to be successful in school and to go on to higher education like Portland State or community colleges or even post-secondary education at the same rates as affluent white children. We're working with the Portland Public Schools at the Urban League to talk about disproportionate discipline, which push our kids out of schools and drive up the very dropout rates we're talking about. Nonprofits like the Urban League are investing in programs that offer children of color and low-income youth access to good after-school programs, healthy foods, fresh air, exercise. We're working hard to serve African Americans with workforce training programs that give them an opportunity to make a living wage. And a lot of you in the room, the private sector employers, we, we work with them to discuss the importance of diversity in the workplace and the benefits that derive from work from employing diverse cultures, races, and ways of thinking. Our, in fact, at our annual dinner on November 17th, we're launching another workforce initiative where we're working with employers to get them plugged in on how to hire, how to communicate, how to outreach, and how to develop these, these vital parts of the community. Um, there was a recent study that showed that uh, what, when America became number one, it was because they used their entire workforce, which meant women. America was not using women in the workforce effectively for many, many years, but it made us number one in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s because we employed women before a lot of the other industrialized nations did. And that's because we were, we were leaving half of our brain trust on the sidelines. If you do that in Portland, with the ethnic minorities and the low income folks, you're gonna do the same thing. And that is what has put us a little bit behind here. So we're looking at creative ways of exploiting everybody in a positive way in the workforce. <laughs> um, so yes, there's a lot going on and a lot of people are thinking and talking about equity and diversity. But what Greater Portland Pulse represents is an opportunity to connect these conversations in a more meaningful way and to agree across sectors and fields, as Dr. Vivo explained, about our priorities and how all this work can be leveraged and ultimately turn these conversations into actions. The unique value of Greater Portland Pulse is that each quarter we'll get a chance to see how all of these efforts in the schools, in the neighborhoods, in local government, and among nonprofits can be better connected. When our housing market begins to recover from its slump, we want to be able to see that coming so we can train the people needed to staff the construction companies that will finally come back to life. And we have resources in our own community, whether it's groups like National Association of Minority Contractors, African American Chamber, Filipino Chamber, Native American Chamber, Hispanic Chamber. We have people that have, are connected to the communities that can get everybody back to work, not just the round up the usual suspects sectors. When the public schools want recent immigrants to become more engaged in schools, nonprofits like the Urban League and others in this room can help put them together, can help, can help put together the kind of meetings and outreach that welcome people, resulting in greater input from the community and better access to more and more effective information. And if Metro wants to increase, increase the use of bicycles among the minority community, the Community Cycling Center and other nonprofits could work with them to help them understand what it would take to get urban minority kids onto bicycles so they gain independence, fresh air, and exercise, and reduce auto traffic in their communities. But quiet as it's kept, uh, people of color have been riding bikes for a long time. We're not, <laughs> we are not anti-cycle, we're just pro life cycle, you know, we're not anti-bicycles, we just want our priorities to be focused on the things that matter most to people first. And the third and final reason I'm involved in this is because we need a long-term, consistent message about the gaps and opportunities for making our place and our people better off, and when I say our, I mean Oregon and Portland. Greater Portland Pulse isn't a single report that's going to be read by a few people and forgotten. The data will be kept up and input. Um, 
If we aren't making progress, it will be evident in the data and we'll adjust on the fly, quarter after quarter, year after year, we'll check and make sure that we are identifying good goals and targets and, and hitting or approaching them. And goals and targets aren't bad words. We can say goals, we can say targets, we can focus on specific things and that's how you get the outcomes that you're seeking. I'd argue that we should take a step further and set targets for closing these gaps in performance and that each time we receive new data, we assess the strategies and see if we're on the right track. Ultimately, equity has to be a way of thinking about how we can advance the well-being of our entire community. My, my colleague Carl Talton says that human capital is the infrastructure of the future. And if we think about that for a moment, we talk about infrastructure and roads and whatever, but the people in this room and the people in this region are the infrastructure of the future. And if we dismiss 40%, 60% of them, uh, then we're not gonna be a very successful region. So what surprised me about the data in the report? Not much. Uh, I'm not surprised that children of color are living in poverty at much higher rates than the overall population. Did you know that 26% of black and Latino children in our region are living in poverty compared to 13% of white children? I knew that, and now you do too. I'm not surprised that the four-year cohort graduation rates among our high school students of color, as Dr. Vivell mentioned, is a lot lower than for white students. I knew that, and now you've heard it twice, you do too. I'm not surprised that unemployment rates for African Americans are higher than those for, right, for whites. Did you know that while the unemployment rate among whites in 2009 was about 11%, it was over 18% for African Americans, 14% for Hispanics, and 16% for Native Americans. I knew that, and you do too now. I'm a little surprised that in some school districts, the gap in graduation rates is as low as 10%, and this was alluded to earlier, that's a success story in, in this state and in this country that it's only 10%. We need to analyze those successes, see what they're doing right, and see if we can emulate them in our school systems. And all this brings me back to my motivation for being involved in Greater Portland Pulse. It's these opportunities to connect, to explore, to test strategies over time that excite me about this project. I want to make sure we stay focused on these objectives that we've laid out and examine our results in this data, two years, five years, seven years, 10 years down the road. And I want to make sure that we're holding ourselves, all of us in this room and all of us in the region, accountable for these results. So thank you for letting me chat with you today. And I'd like to invite Dr. Vivell back up to the podium. Thank you. I'm just the uh, wrap up hitter here. Uh, you know, we first began this project about two years ago when we asked community leaders whether a project like this should be a priority for our community. And the resounding answer really had two parts. We need to measure what is most important, and we need to get together on a regular basis to talk about what's going right, what's going wrong, and where we need to make adjustments. We've delivered on those community aspirations with the Greater Portland Pulse. For the first time, anyone can check the pulse of the Greater Portland Region. At PortlandPulse.org, 72 interconnected indicators on nine topics reveal how the region is doing economically, socially, and environmentally. And these measures were created through an active dialogue that will continue with conversations about where we are and where we're going. Because only then can you move from data to knowledge to wisdom, to policy, and finally, to action. Now we need to create a backbone organization that will support this project going forward. Over the next couple of months, the Greater Portland Pulse Advisory Committee will be assessing the options for an ongoing structure for the project. The project will be supported by contributions from every sector of the community to ensure that the data are fresh, that the conversation continues, and that we guide the future of the region by keeping track of what's most important. Portland State University has committed to supporting this project at $50,000 per year over the next several years. Unless you think that we're rolling in money, we're taking this from the grant that we got from the Miller Foundation to support sustainability efforts because this is very much about the social equity side of sustainability. And furthermore, the funds will primarily support 
our undergraduate and graduate students who will be working on putting the data together. I challenge our community partners, cities, counties, public agencies, universities, community colleges, foundations, businesses, to consider the value of this project to their own organizations and to the broader community. If we all contribute something, we build a project that can really beat the pants of those other cities. <laughs> I invite you to visit the project's website at portlandpulse.org. And we have expanded the server capacity to this morning to make sure you won't get knocked <laughs> off. Take a look at all the data and play with the charting tools. Read the reports and get a sense of where our region is and where it needs to go. Sign on to the endorsement page to show that you agree that this is an important part of the future of the region. And join in the conversation by telling us how you will use the data and what other information you would like to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vim. Before I introduce our, our Friday Forum host, if you have written a question on one of those index cards, now is the time to raise them so the City Club staff can see them and retrieve them from you. The first question for our speaker, as our tradition holds, will come from our Friday Forum host, who today is City Club Governor Steve Rosenbaum. Steve serves as President and CEO of PopArt, an interactive marketing agency. A club member since 2009, Steve currently serves on the Communications Subcommittee and on the Finance Committee. Steve? Hey, um, I'm going to try and address the, the a giant elephant that I, I kind of see around this issue. Um, the PortlandPulse.org website uh, boasts about the absolute neutrality and accuracy of its data and its reporting. And all, all three of our speakers today um, acknowledged that there are multiple perspectives on what equity means and that equity is such an important concept. Um, yet I, I didn't hear anything about are we doing anything to measure distribution of wealth. We're, we're measuring income, we're measuring access to education. Are we measuring distribution of wealth? If so, how? And if not, why? And I'll, I'll open it up to any of you guys. I'll, I'll try to take a first uh, stab at it. The, the, I think the most exciting thing to me about this project is that it's not sort of fixed forever. That uh, the, seeing the data so if somebody says, okay, we, we are measuring this, but you don't quite have that, there's an opening there to start a dialogue about, well, what else could we get? Ultimately, we're, of course, constrained by data that exists. This is an effort to use data that have been collected by the whole range of agencies that exist. Because, you know, doing independent data collection, that's where you really start running into, into big money. So there's actually a range of indicators of housing values, other ways that you can get at the question of wealth. But you can only do it to the extent that those data are readily available. And I think we can keep working on expanding it because there are so many ways to have a dialogue about what equity means. Marcus, do you have anything to add? Otherwise, we'll go to other questions. Rex? You know? Well, I think you raised it right. Uh, data basic, that you collect basically reflects the dominant paradigm. And so what you have is the people who are in the system asking their questions, and they will look for data that answers their questions. And this is a key piece of having the partnership, one. And second, to have the equity working group to, to help us out, to be able to say, well, are those data really reflecting the world that we know? And it, I agree with President Vivell that this is an uh, evolutionary process, that we do want to look for better measures that cross disciplines, that look at the various issues in different ways than we have in the past, and we're looking for uh, the participation of the wider community to help us understand are the data that we currently have actually valid and useful for making the kind of decisions we need to make. We will now take questions from the floor. As always, members are invited to the microphone to ask their question. 
Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a club member and ask your questions in 30 seconds or less. If I flash the famous City Club question mark, this means that you need to get to the question. Also, I will be sure to ask at least one question from the index cards at the floor. Hi there, uh, Nick Grant, I'm a City Club member. Um, quick question about uh, the difference between aggregate data and local uh, specific data. Um, I know people like to look up their house on Google Maps and say, oh, there I am. Um, it's easy for people to, to take individual data and confuse that with what's aggregate data. Could you say something about how this will address that issue? Yeah, the, the data that we have now are, on the one hand, quite nicely disaggregated at the level of things like neighborhoods or different ethnic groups or racial groups or age groups, you know, depending a little bit on the particular uh, data and indicators that you're talking about. It does not go down, I think, on anything that's in there to, yeah, looking up today's home value according to Zillow. Um, because that is a, is a very different kind of effort. This is about trying to figure out what is going on in the community and giving people and organizations the tools to think about what is happening with either the geographic area or the group that they are most concerned with and how that compares with others. So that's the focus of the effort. But just on that point, uh, disaggregated data in any of these looks is, is absolutely key. For example, I know Portland schools and other school districts have some good school report data lately. But one thing that we really need to key on is, but how does that play out for Native Americans, for Hispanic Americans, for African Americans? Sometimes we can have a net rise with the majority population and a very severe cliff for non-majority population. So disaggregating the data, even if we roll it up ultimately, is crucial when you're looking at this on an individual basis. So I would just continue to always keep that in mind. Before we get to the next question, I see some other index cards floating around. If you're still holding one of those, be sure to raise your hand so the staff can get them. Go ahead. Uh, Felisa Hagen, City Club member. I'm very interested. Um, I think that this project brings us closer to agreeing upon some of the issues in our community, some of the problems. But I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on next steps for solutions and the issue of accountability. I heard each of the speakers mention this is a way to hold us accountable, the, the collective we. But it would be good to hear how we hold private institutions accountable public institutions accountable and businesses accountable in this environment to really to reach some of those collective decisions and solutions to the problems. Yeah, that's that's a great question and there's been a fair amount of discussion about that in the project and I think there are probably two key ways that it that it happens. Um, one is for instance in the category of prosperity which the earlier question was about you know, we're looking at six indicators that relate to individual and family prosperity, three indicators that relate to business prosperity, and then one that relates to government efficiency. Now, any organization or group of people can use those data to write a report, to raise issues, to talk to whoever they decide is the particular body that's responsible for that. So it gives the tools essentially for grassroots, collective, and individualized efforts to ask questions about, well, what's happening along these lines? But in addition to that, and this is where it was very interesting, we had several mayors involved in the advisory committee. Um, they can use it at the city council levels, at Metro Council, at the Multnomah County, the various governments, to think about how are we progressing as a governmental unit that ultimately has been elected to be responsible for certain things and measure where we are doing well and where we're not doing well. So I think it, the project itself does not determine who is ultimately the agency that uh, should be holding other people accountable. It creates the tools and gives the option to a lot of different organizations to take that action. Thomas, if I may just get one here from the microphone. Which government bodies have committed to use these metrics to guide their work? Rex, would you speak to that? Well, I guess the question I have is, do you have the list? 
because um, the, the list is actually uh, fairly long in terms of partners in developing the project. And so the question then is, what's the follow-up? And I think that's one of the key questions we have. The Metro Council has committed in terms of funding. There's other agencies that have committed in terms of funding. So at least on that level, there is a commitment from some. I think that, and this relates to the last question actually too, is what, how do we work this into our systems so that it is something that we look at during budget time. Budget comes, actually we may start making decisions on next year's budget in November, and all governments do that. They have to set goals and targets, and so it, on the public side, to get this and work this into the system so we look at these issues uh, and, and try to think about our programming and investing and how we address those. So I think that's a key piece. I think uh, the other one is we need to do more work in terms of the governance structure to set up a, a body that will be holding onto this and partly there's some just with the economic crisis there's a lot of uncertainty about taking on new projects among some of the, the groups that might be the logical homes of this. But I'll just give an example of in the Silicon Valley where they've been doing a performance a measurement program like this for a long time, the Silicon Valley Partnership is the keeper of this data and they actually look through it and they say here's the key issues that we think we need to deal with in the next couple of years and that's their advice to local governments and others how to use it. I think having an open source data uh, like this allows any organization and group to take a look at the data and then advocate based on facts that here are some very important issues that we need to deal with. So I, it, it is a, a new aborning effort I would say and we need to prove its value and worth to the organizations uh, that we hope will use it. But also I really hope that everyone will take a look at it from whatever perspective that you are coming from and say this is a tool where I can help advance the agenda that I have and help improve my community. Great, thank you. Back to the microphone. Uh, Kurt Wabring, member. Um, this is sort of a follow-on question to what you uh, was just asked in the interesting responses. I mean, here you have two years, you got a bunch of actors that participated, you have a commitment from uh, PSU of $50,000 a year, which is organizationally, to run something like this, a good start, let's put it that way, um, but not enough. Um, so I'm wondering what the thinking is now about an institutional home or a framework. And I'll reference what Kitzhaber has done for education, is he's gone K through uh, uh, college to create a unified board with some power and such. Uh, any thinking in that direction in terms of this sort of thing? Or, or where's your thinking, I guess, about institutionalizing this? Sure. Um, well, I think we have some models and examples in the community of finding a home for an effort that's this ambitious. I know that uh, one thing that I look to is kind of the cradle to career, which I guess some of the people even on this panel are involved in, or um, which is now was housed at the Portland Schools Foundation, which I believe has now become all hands raised. But it had a lot of partners, it created a focused place for it to land, and I think we've had lots of discussions about where this does land, and I will defer to the co-chair on this, but where would it land? It would need to be a broad-based setting with a lot of resources, with the intellectual capacity, with the support from the governments. It could be a university, it could be a broad-based uh, home like a metro or a United Way. There's there's a lot of different options that, that uh, that have come up in the discussion, but ultimately it has to be someone with enough organizational heft to walk it all the way through. There, if I can just add to that a little bit, the advisory committee will actually issue an RFP to ask organizations whether they want to uh, house this and what parts of it. There are probably at least two or three key parts. One is obviously the data piece, but the other one is the, uh, the discussion about what measures should be included, what are the goals that we should be measuring, and then there could be a third piece, which is the follow-up, so now what do we do with all this? On the one hand, you can have a let a thousand flowers bloom approach, the data is there, anybody can use them, or you can think about a more deliberate effort of an organization that really tries to get into that, how do we hold people accountable? Some of that is frankly an issue of how much funding 
uh, will, be, will be available for that. And there could be different organizations that take different pieces of this follow-up. And that's the stage where we're now at. And frankly, being here today is part of the effort to let more people know about it, to get organizations to think about this in terms of what role they want to play. Another one from the tables. What does Greater Portland Pulse suggest is the greatest area of unmet need? In short, where does the region really not measure up? <laughs> Don't all jump in at once. No, no, I think what it is is that it, that's a measure of the gap between your aspirations and dreams and reality. And I think we could probably pick any of the areas and say we are not doing well enough. You know, and of course, uh, if you go around the world, or around the country, people look at us and go, God, you're doing such a great job on X, Y, and Z. We, we're jealous. But I think what we have is, and this is the strength, and I don't know how you measure this one, you know, someone out there figure out how to do this, is we have a, a community that expects more and wants more. And so our aspirations are great. And so I would say that in almost every area, we are not doing as well as we'd like to do. And our, and our goals and targets are much higher than what the existing conditions are, whether it's the economy, the environment, social equity. And, and I think that's actually one of the strongest, um, you know, one of the strongest strengths we have in this region are people who expect and aspire and will work hard to make things better. Tom Karwaki, City Club member. The, uh, Smartphone or a mobile device is uh, the way that over half of the uh, minority communities, particularly Hispanic and American Indian, uh, use and get to the web. Uh, when are you going to port the uh, site over to a mobile application or at least to make it so that it is usable on a mobile device? It's a, it's a great question. And for this, I'm going to just look over at uh, my colleague Sheila Martin and her <laughs> assistants her wonderful team who've been working on this and who really, uh, along with Rita Conrad from Metro, deserve really all the credit for doing the hard work. So uh, they're gonna do it. They're going to be working on this, right, Sheila? <laughs> Let's say we're, we're looking for partners. <laughs> well, it has an equity issue. An another one from the tables. If each of you could take one data point or one revelation from the report and move it into action, which would it be? Well, I, I, I will start. We tried to address it a little bit. Obviously, for me, being in the education business, it is the reality that the legislature has now set 40-40-20 as a goal for education. 40% of the population should have a college degree, 40% some post-secondary education, 20% the high school degree, and we've fallen short on all three measures of that. Um, seeing especially the uh, discrepancies, you know, this indeed it was not a surprise, but seeing the specific data on the discrepancies and also being able to break that down, not just by ethnicity, but by geography, by neighborhood, helps us think hard about where do we go, where do we do, we, do, we do the outreach, who do we partner with to be able to reach out to the groups that are now not getting into that pipeline uh, to make sure that we can reach that goal. And f uh, the one data pay point for me uh, would be a workforce data point, the unemployment. You can go, I, I was just informed by one of the people on the project today, you can go from as close as one census tract to another census tract and see a, a, a huge disparity in the unemployment rate and in fact a huge disparity in the uh, um, in the educational uh, high school graduation rate as well. So I would make sure that as we're looking at track to track data points, that's a good indicator of what's working successfully in one region, sometimes very adjacent to each other, and what, what are they doing successfully there, and how can we emulate the success? That's what the data would reveal to me. And I'll just pick uh, civic engagement, that all members of our communities feel that they have a opportunity uh, maybe even the obligation to participate in their community, whether it's getting involved in political issues, getting involved at their local schools, getting involved in their community in any sense at all. And I think the, pe the people feel empowered and have the right and have the opportunity to do that was a measure that I would like to see us uh, make equal and high. 
Well, thank you all. I, apologies to those still in line, but we've run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for today. Please join us next week when Mark Langseth of the I Have a Dream Foundation will address how to help low-income children achieve academic success. And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation to today's guests, Rex Burkholder, Marcus Mundy, and Mundy and Vim Vibel. Thank you so much, and we're adjourned. <laughs>